did that. Okay. Um, can you hear again? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, that link you can use to follow along. That link takes you to the same slides. Uh, we'll get started then. Um, so yeah, today we are going to talk about accessible and privacy centric web. So in recent trends, websites and softwares often focus on visual beauty and fancy UI more than usability and inclusivity. But the thing is, if your product doesn't support the basic human rights like accessibility, security and privacy, then your product is not usable by everyone. And if it's not usable by everyone, well, you can call it more like some user experience, right? It's not user experience then. I, in this slide, there is a link to a great talk by Billy Gregory on some user experience. Don't start watching it right now. Listen to my talk, you can watch that in a free time. So yeah, today we will talk about some ideas and methodologies that developers, designers, and the product team as a whole can adopt to make websites more accessible and privacy centric. At certain points, it might sound like I'm ranting, but I'll try to keep it more on the positive side. A little bit about me, though I'm mostly introduced, I'm self-proclaimed human rights centered developer, which means I focus on security, accessibility, privacy, and usability more than making fancy UX and um, bothering about which new UI framework you should use. I'm also a maintainer of open source projects like OnionShare, Vactel, and the Ally project. I was also the author of security and accessibility chapter in Web Almanac 2022. So before we get started on the different methods of how to make your websites accessible and privacy, I want to talk a little bit about who are the people who are using your websites, right? Because I feel it's really important to understand who are the people who are using and benefiting from this accessibility and privacy features, and not just doing it because some law or standards need you to do that. So what we are going to tr start with is interfaces used to browse web. Now, most of you are familiar with mouse users or touch users. Mouse users are the ones who use mouse in laptops or keyboards, and touch users in more like phone, right? And most websites and products work really great with mouse users and touch users. In fact, I might go as far as to say that a lot of websites are designed just thinking about mouse users and touch users in mind. But there's a lot more. Keyboard users. How many of you have tried browsing the web using just keyboard without any mouse or touch? Okay, if you did, you would know it's a pretty terrible experience in many websites. And while for some people it might be a choice to use keyboard, for many people it's the only way they can actually browse through the website using a keyboard. Like people with temporary or permanent motor disabilities, they need to use keyboards. Like in the picture, you can see a person who is using a stick and with the stick, they will be pressing the different keys on the keyboard. And that's how they navigate through the website. Switch device users. This is very similar to keyboard users, but even more limited. So this is for people with limited dexterity. So what is a switch device? A switch device is like a keyboard, but it has only two keys. One key is used for scrolling through the website or like the tab key on a keyboard and the other key is used for selecting so it's like an enter key or a space key so a very famous user of switch device was stephen hawking so yeah a lot of people depend on switch device in the picture you can see a person the headrest of his chair has a switch device so there are two switches and he can use his head to press each button and that's how he browses through the web Screen reader users. It's very important. People with limited or no vision actually use screen readers to browse through the web. But they, mostly when you are using a screen reader, you will actually be using something like a keyboard actually. So a screen reader user often uses the keyboard to navigate and then the screen reader speaks out whatever they are going through. So if your website is already user friendly for keyboard users, it's already a step towards making a screen reader user friendly. Also, screen reader users, like most of the screen readers that are there across operating systems and phones, uh, they have other features as well. So some screen readers can actually navigate through the headings of the website. Some screen readers can navigate through different landmarks in a website. So it's also really important to learn how to write good HTML. But I will come to that rant a little later. Zoom. This is one of the most available assistive technology. Almost all devices, browsers, phones support Zoom. 
but it's also most neglected technology. Some websites even disable Zoom completely, which you should not do. Zoom is really, really important for people with low vision. So please ensure that your software and websites actually work. Firstly, it's zooming and secondly, when you are zooming, it still works and people can read through the website and use the website. And there are many more as well. There is mouth stick, there's voice, sip and puff device, braille input and braille display and reduced motion. So people who, um, who suffer from different disabilities that are triggered by motion. So if your website has a lot of animations, you should ensure there is a media query in CSS which you can use so that you are ensuring that if they have opted in for reduced motion, then I won't show any animation. So these are the things very important to keep in mind. Now, just like there are different people have different accessibility needs, the privacy needs also vary from people to people, right? It depends on their security needs and their threat model. So for example, journalists, lawyers, they might have a high security need. Also, it depends on the country they are in, what kind of laws there is, what kind of government there is, and it might um, change their threat model. And so that changes their privacy needs. And it's important to understand that not everyone who has a high security and privacy need is like a tech-savvy person who uses a terminal and writes very difficult code. No, journalists and lawyers might be using a normal Windows computer. And they might be using different other tools like VPN for circumvention or anonymizing tools like Tor. So it's very important to check that your website and product still works with those things, right? So if your website just stops working completely in Tor because your entire website depends on JavaScript and Tor disables JavaScript, that doesn't really help the privacy focused users. So with that, let's get started with different ideologies that we can follow to make your website more privacy and accessibility centric. Firstly, progressive enhancement. I feel this is a really, really important approach. What I mean in progressive enhancement is something like this. So this is a picture from a blog called The Power of Progressive Enhancement by Andy Bill. So there are two different pictures and you can, they are really good analogies of whether it's progressively enhanced or not. The first one is not progressively enhanced. So you can see the first three stages. The car is not really usable, right? The, if it just has one wheel, you can't do much with it. Neither can you do with the second stage nor with the third stage. Only when you have a car, you can use it. But in the second picture, you can see first it's a skateboard. You can move around with it. Then it's a little bit enhanced. Then it becomes a bicycle and then a scooter. So there is, in every stage, it's still usable, but every stage enhances a little bit. So that's what I mean by progressive enhancement. How to do progressive enhancement? Start with basic HTML. What happens is a lot of times what we focus these days is we jump into directly starting writing code in React or Angular or Vue. And when you do that, you really miss out on what the markup is. Because at the end of the day, what the user sees is HTML. The different assistive technologies see is HTML. So if you start writing from some JavaScript framework, what happens is you f miss out the, the markup. So the document doesn't become really accessible and privacy centric. So start with the basic HTML. Then add basic CSS, that's almost available in all browsers. Then add modern CSS to enhance. Now when I say modern CSS, CSS has got leaps and bound in the last few years. Almost every feature that you feel like you need a JavaScript for probably can be done with modern CSS these days. So try to add via those. And then add JavaScript. Even if you're using React, I would say follow this flow. Yeah, yeah, I know, but yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, add JavaScript to improve. Great, censor the JavaScript part, I love it. Um, add JavaScript to improve the interactions, right? So what happens is if someone has JavaScript, they can still be using it and they will get the enhanced feature. But if they don't want JavaScript, it's still usable for them. They can go through the content of the website, they can go through everything. Why use progressive enhancement? So it helps in both privacy and accessibility. When, uh, when a user is using a keyboard, if it has a good markup, it's already easier to navigate. It happens like if you are using React and then you're making a button using just div buttons, 
that's not accessible because then you can't use keyboards you can't use screen readers screen readers stop working so even if you are using react you need to know that when you are creating a button you need to use the button html tag if it's a link you need to use anchor tag so if you already start with the html then that when you're doing the react part or any other javascript it already improves so it's good for accessibility even for privacy because a lot of privacy centric tools don't support javascript because javascript let's face it it's a great language but it can be used by attackers in a very bad way so they often have the javascript disabled and if your website just stops working completely when it's javascript disabled it's not usable by your vc users so it's good to have progressive enhancement and that solves both the problems. The other thing that we developers often forget is websites are built for everyone. We developers often have this argument that it works in my machine. But websites are not supposed to just work in your machine, it's supposed to work in everyone's machine and everyone's operating system, every different assistive technology, every different browser. So websites are built for everyone, so that's why you need to keep in mind that. We'll go through a quick example here of how a progressive enhancement works. So this is a very common example called auto filter. You see it everywhere in all e-commerce websites, booking websites. What it does is you have a listing, then you click on a checkbox and it automatically updates the listing. Now that's a great user experience, but it's also very JavaScript dependent. So if someone is opening this website in Tor and let's say they click on the checkbox, what happens is nothing really happens for them because how forms work is you need to submit the form and then only the listing will update. So how you would progressively enhance this? First, you have a submit button. Create the entire filter with a submit button, even if it looks very bad, doesn't matter. Have a submit button so that anyone who has JavaScript disabled can still click on the checkbox, click on the submit, their list will get updated. Then when you are writing JavaScript, hide the submit button using JavaScript and then add your JavaScript features. So anyone who has JavaScript enables still gets the same experience, but anyone who doesn't, they can still use the website. The functionality is still there for them. The other really important thing is don't rely on permissions, give alternatives. Often websites, even like food delivery apps, right? So you need the location and everyone is like, okay, the user needs to give me the location permission. Now anyone who is very privacy and security focused, they might not want you to give the location permission for all the time. So you need to start with a input box that a user can fill up. And that's the thing that you start with. Then you progressively enhance using JavaScript to take location permission from them. And if they're fine with it, great. If they're not fine with it, the input box is still there, which they can fill out manually. So don't rely on permissions, always give alternatives. The next important point is design translation. And this is something today also, it came up in the open source design workshop that's going on. It's very important that designers and developers communicate between each other. A lot of open source projects and other projects also have like a very the designer creates a design, hands it over to the developer. Developer sees the design, implements it. Now what happens is, let's say the developer is really accessibility concerned. And when they see the design and they are like, okay, they didn't think about this accessibility issue, so I will just implement something for, by myself. And that breaks the design and then the flow is not really good. So it's always good to start the discussion at the very beginning when the designer is starting to make the designs attend those calls, attend those meetings, discuss the issues at that time itself. Discuss the privacy concerns, like talk to them, see, we can't rely on location permission, for example. So you have to also give me a design for an input box because that's how we are going to build it. So discuss those, have those conversations. Another good thing to do is accessibility annotations. So have your developers or the people who are accessibility experts to go through the designs and mark the design like, for example, if you have a huge navigation, what you do is you have a skip link. So that's defined in the WCAG standards that you have a skip link that goes to the main content. Now the designer might not be aware of that. 
So you need to say, okay, there is a skip link that I need to add. You need to give a design for that as well, where it should be, how it should appear when the skip link appears. Or let's say the heading structure. This is a very big mistake that people do is like the designers do the heading structure in a more aesthetic way and the developers just follow the bigger the heading, the bigger the heading level in HTML. That's not true. So have that discussion also with the designers. Very important, learn HTML. It's not just div and span, right? There's a lot more elements, so it's very important. And the thing is, I have talked to a lot of people and when I say learn HTML, they're like, yeah, everyone knows HTML. Is it even a programming language? Different talk. But the thing is, the issue with HTML is the syntax is very simple, right? So to learn the syntax, it's very easy. You take a day or two and you get the syntax. But the beauty of the language doesn't lie in the syntax, it lies in the semantics. So each of the tags, each of the different HTML tags has a meaning. And you need to understand the meaning behind them and then use them accordingly because then they are used accordingly by the browser, by the assistive technology. For example, what should be a link or a button? You need to decide that. A link is something that goes to another page, but a button is something which just stays in the page and takes you to a different area. Now, what happens is when I'm using through mouse, it doesn't really matter because you are going there and clicking it. But for keyboard users, it's completely different. So you need to understand when it's a link, when it's a button. Also, like I said, the screen reader you the screen readers actually allow you to navigate the website through different landmarks, different headings. So what happens is if you go by the design and let's say a uh, heading is much bigger and then you did something like you put an H1, then you put H3, then you put H2, that actually breaks the layout of the page. Even though to us it doesn't really matter because we are looking at the visual design, but when someone is going through a screen reader, that breaks the layout. So a heading, you can think of a heading like when you read a book, the first page of the book has like the contents. So it will have a structure where it's like one big topic under that many subtopics, then another subtopic. So that's how a heading should follow. So a good HTML document should use meaningful semantic tags. It breaks page into proper landmarks. What I mean by landmarks is what is a header? What is a footer? This part is an article. If it's an article, you can mention it's an article, right? If it's a navigation, you can use the navigation tag. So there are different tags and the screen readers will allow you to navigate through those landmarks. So it's very important you follow that. And a good document outline with headings. Doesn't matter in the design what is a bigger size. Use your CSS to define that. Your HTML should still follow H1, then H2, then H3, and that structure. The other very important thing is user testing and audits. Many open source projects don't do that, but they're really necessary. There are a lot of fundings out there which support user testing and audits, so get it done. Involve varied groups of users when you're doing user testing because if you are already using the users who were already there for your product, it doesn't really help. I have heard this argument a lot. Why should I make my website screen reader friendly? I don't have any screen reader users. Well, probably because your website is not screen reader friendly. That's why you don't have screen reader users. So involve varied group of users. Involve users with different privacy needs. Involve users with different assistive technologies. And that's when you can find out what are the things that are really lacking. Automated tests are good. Definitely have them, but they are not enough. You will need to sit with real users using real devices and do user research and user testing with them. And the bell comes at a very nice point, so I'll just stand here for some time and let you see that slide. So, really important to understand, it's not a technical debt. Don't treat accessibility, privacy, and security needs as technical debt. Many people start, oh, let's build out the functionality, then we will think about it later, and that later never comes. And also it's important when you see how the progressive enhancement workflow starts, 
it's good to have accessibility and privacy discussions from the very beginning because once you have made a completely inaccessible website, believe me, it takes a lot much more effort to make it accessible. But if you have those discussions at the very beginning, it's really not that hard. You just need to understand a few different things and you can make it. You can have those discussions in the beginning rather than rewriting the entire code base again, which some people love to do. But don't treat it as a technical debt. It's really important. If it's not usable by everyone, it's not good. So there is no MVP without accessibility, not without security, not without privacy. Very important. Don't treat it as technical debt. Start discussing on the very beginning. Thanks. There are some links. That's my website link. Uh, that's a Mastodon link. If someone is still using IRC, I saw Coscup has IRC. Great, I'm there in IRC. And I needed to change the link for the slides, but that's okay. Yes, there are tools, but again, like I said, automated tests are not always great, but there are tools. There is a tool by um, AXCore, A-X-E. So if you search A-X-E, you will see a tool. They have browser extensions. So you can go through that and that will give you the things. But then again, like I said, it's automated tools. And like there is a great talk by a friend of mine called Manuel, who's, it's a talk or a blog, I am not sure. but. He goes through how you can completely break an accessibility testing tool and still make your website very inaccessible. So yeah, those tools definitely help get the very easy things, but it's still important that either you go through someone who is an accessibility expert. So there are different organizations who will take your project and do an audit for you and tell every step, like they will use the WCAG guideline and they will go through your entire website or software and they will say, okay, this standards is not followed, this standards is not followed, and they will point it out. It's like a checklist, but a real person will do it for you. So if you go through those organizations, but there are different checklists available on the website. There are different extensions. There is also one called Wave. So Wave also uses, you can use that to see how your heading outline actually looks for other devices. So there are different tools. There is a checklist in the Ally project, which I mentioned. It's A11Y project, you can search. So that also has a checklist. Any other? Sure. I guess she has a question, yeah. Right. So there are a few different things. Firstly, that's the place where actually the law and the standards really help. Like for example, in Europe and US, you need to have WCAG 2.1 AA at least maintained in your website. That's required by the government. It's not always enforced, but since that's required, that's easier for you to convince the product team that please let's do this because it's a requirement. But also there are different, like firstly, yes, maybe try to say that See, firstly, your user group will increase, right? So if you have it accessible, there are more people who will use it also. But also it's like uh, that discussion will be, 
<laughs> it's it's difficult it's i know i have had that discussion a lot many time it's difficult the other thing that i start convincing people to do is start with something called accessibility statement so a lot of websites in the footer you will see there is something called an accessibility statement and they go to a page what that accessibility statement basically has is something like hey see we want to be wcag whatever standard that you are following compliant we have not been able to fully finish all the checklists but here is a place where you can go and file issues if you find some issues and otherwise we are trying to do what we are like if you already have a list of issues right you just did an audit and someone gave you a list of issues so mention that in the accessibility statement that we are in the process but we have not been there yet you if you also find tell us that makes your website at least be like okay they are thinking about it and then we are, once you start seeing like a lot of accessibility issues coming through that's probably a good time to go and have the discussion again with the product team that see people might be using more if they really got through this thing No, actually, I, I have not tried Footpanda, but I, I think Footpanda also has it, which is like, yeah, if you deny, they usually do give a box which you can, and, and like, for example, Zomato, you mentioned it has an enter manually option. So if you just go to your phone and turn off locations completely, then you will see that an enter manually thing will appear. And when you enter manually, you can add it into the input box. But yes, that's not, they are big companies, so they are probably already having other people who are advising for them. But many open source projects might not be aware of it and they just assume that someone has location permission, so it's important. Okay. Any other questions? There are some stickers left, I think, in that table. Yeah, so if you want to grab some stickers, great. They are not designed by me. They are designed by other folks working in accessibility space. Amazing folks. Thank you.